received $11.50, which is a lot of money for cans. So just keep bringing your cans and leave them out by the door, and I'll take them home. And when we get a big pile, I'll take them in again. Oh, and that's so neat. also, Gail and Tom called us yesterday in the morning. They've been on vacation to Manitou Springs, Colorado. <laughs> I don't know again if you've seen the news, but that's where they had the mudslides and um, it was a flash flood, yes. And uh, if they had been parked on the lower level of the motel that they stayed in, they would not have a car. Wow. They were on the top level, so they were lucky. But she said the boulders in the street, and I got pictures that she sent. And, and then we saw some on the news. but. I couldn't believe that they were there. I just knew they were going to call that Gail. Oh, yeah, I saw them on television before. Yeah, so we need to pray for those people. We're so blessed right here. We went to uh, our district superintendent's office, and that was flooded uh, in Hutchison. Uh, we went there, and there were there, lots of fans, and things were all displaced. Things that were on the floor were all no good. Aww. So it's happened to the east of us, and it's happening to the west. And we've just been blessed. Mm -hmm. We just had flooded roads. And the Lord is so good, our car was able to, our cars were able to come through them. <laughs> Any other uh, cares, concerns? Nice to have a new grandson here with us. Oh, he's been here all the lot. Nice to have him in church. Well, let us uh, continue to praise and thank God. And let us go to God in prayer. Oh God, today uh, I come and I beg your mercy, your grace, your love, your tolerance for America. Father, we're going through so much at this time. I ask to tell you, help us and bless us. And bless our enemies, Lord. Give them open hearts and minds that they might not uh, want to hurt us anymore. Or they might want to live and let us live. Lord, we often talk about faith. Please help us to become faithful. Remind us that faith, like grace, is a gift from a loving God. Strengthen us so our faith is emboldened in Jesus' name. As we worship together today, let us look at the faces we know. Let us look at the faces we love. This community of kindred hearts. And then as we leave, let us look about to see the faces of those we hardly know, those we don't know, strangers, sojourners, forgotten friends, aliens, the ones who need an outstretched hand, maybe ours. Let us see the image of God in all people around the world. Remember that Jesus Christ gave his life, his life for all humankind. Let others see the love of Jesus Christ in each and every one of us as we leave this place. Let us not be judgmental or uncaring, but let us love the world and do our best just as Jesus Christ loves us. Jesus Christ loves the whole world, the world that God gave, and God gave God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, for all of us the whole world. Father, we come this day just expressing our thanks and our gratitude and our praise. You are an awesome God. Thank you for sending your rains and thank you for preserving us. Bless this congregation here present. Bless each and every one of our family members, wherever they might be, and uh, watch over them. Bring them back safely through the floods mudslides and everything that happens, Lord, we ask that you take care of our own and bring them back safely. Watch over us this week as we try to shed the light of Jesus Christ in a very dark world. Bless all our leaders, 
the Lord help them to uh, want to lead, knowing that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Bless those who protect us around the world, Lord, and we ask that you move on the hearts and minds of those who are in charge to bring our soldiers back home quickly, safely, and expeditiously. Bless each and every one of us, we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us how to say, Our Father, and our Lord, Lord and heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Please turn with me now to 509. Uh, Jesus Savior Pilate.
come home from the marriage feast, so that they may open to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will gird himself and help them sit at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them so, blessed are those servants. But notice that if the household had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Now, please turn with me in the, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, chapter 1 is found on page 600 of the Pew Bibles. Page 600 of the Pew Bibles. And we'll read verses 1, 4, and then we'll open down. Uh, 10 through 20. The book of Isaiah, page 600. Listen to the word of God. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jehoiakim, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons and daughters who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. So now let's go to verse 10, page 601. It talks about God's requirement of a holy life. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of the fat beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of peacocks. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of hearing them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of God. From those two passages, I want to address our way of living, and my topic is getting our hearts right. Getting our hearts right. You know, we as human beings, we see others on the outside. And, uh, you know, we all look good. We all look great. But God sees us in our hearts. God looks at our hearts. Jesus Christ is coming back just as he promised. You know, most of the Old Testament promises in the Old Testament, that Jesus Christ is coming back, the Lord, they would say the Lord is coming. Most of those prophecies have not been fulfilled. In fact, less than half have been fulfilled in the first 
coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wants all of us Christians to be ready for his return at an unexpected time. It's going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to come when we least expect. When we think, oh, well, everything's fine, our houses are fine. Look at the, all the stuff we have in our houses. All the gold and silver and jewelry and everything. And when we least expect it, a thief comes in takes it all. And we're left with that. The prophet Isaiah warns that God is not pleased with hollow worship and sacrifice. One must be cleansed by ceasing to do evil and one must continually be seeking justice. Luke tells us that God takes pleasure in opening God's realms to us. Our Father wants to give us the very, very best. We must be alert, therefore, and ready to take action. God's reign is in two phases. It's both here now, we're living in the kingdom of God, and it's not yet fully realized. Wouldn't be fully realized until Jesus Christ comes back with the saints. And he could come back right now, or if he comes in another hundred years or so, we the saints would be coming back with him. We must keep the faith. We've got to believe. We've got to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ promised that he would return. Now I know he said that 2,000 years ago, and it's, oh, well, maybe he didn't know what he was talking about, but I assure you, he does. He would have said it unless he meant it. And he said he's coming back, he said it, and I believe We, in society, try to ignore or deny the existence of sin. In our lives individually, we deny the existence of sin in society. We speak of the system. Oh, the system is so good. If someone's tried in the presence of uh, his, his fellow jurors, the jury is stacked. You know, we just believe in the system, which is so perfect. But I tell you, sin exists in our hearts and in the system. Society says that sin is inconsequential. But it isn't. It's not. We can function healthily and normally as a society or as individuals, even if we try to hide our sin. You see, we can hide our sins from someone else, but we can't hide our sins from God. Isaiah says, the people of Judah are a sinful nation. Was he only speaking of the people of Judah? Well, that's what's written in the Bible. He says, the people of Judah are a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers. Children who deal corruptly. And you just heard me read that in Isaiah 1, verse 4. Isaiah says, sin is serious business. And it has serious repercussions. Some people say, well, if you sin, there's no problem. God can undo all that you've done. No, God can't do that. God can't undo our sin. Let's take uh, a person who perhaps not married and goes out and has a child and God can't undo that and undo the child and take the child back. You know, the child is here. Now what God can do is God can have that person find a, a very good spouse and God can help that child come up as God would like the child to come up. But you can't undo sin. Adam sinned, our first human being. Adam sinned and all of his offspring, all of us are sinners. So 
Look at it this way. Uh, I've been blessed. God has blessed me with four sons. And really, they don't look like somebody else. They kind of look a little bit like Dorothy and me. And if I'm a sinner, then I've passed on my features and I've passed on my sin nature to my son. My friends, sin contaminates every human being. Sin contaminates our relationship with a pure, righteous, almighty, magnificent, holy God. Awesome God. Sin contaminates our relationship with those we love. Sin contaminates our inner harmony and peace in our hearts. Someone once said, our souls are restless until they find their rest in thee, Lord Jesus. So, how can we rid our hearts of sin? The prophet is telling us we must rid our hearts of sin. Well, I'm going to give you some points. Recognize sin for its destructive and diabolical nature. We must recognize sin for what it is. It's destructive and it's diabolical in its nature. Let's look at verse uh, 120 from Isaiah. It's, well, let's look at 19 and 20. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, and sin is rebellion, if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we must recognize sin for its destructive and diabolical nature. Sin violates the covenant relationship we have with a loving God. God said to Adam, now if you, if you don't sin, well this is a paraphrase, if you, if you do good, you don't sin, you can live in this garden and you don't have to worry, the food will be there, everything will be fine. You wouldn't have to worry about the sweat of your brow. Or, you know, things will be great. But Adam rebelled against that covenant relationship. It is disobedience against a gracious, loving, heavenly Father. We do our own thing but without regard of what God wants us to do. Many times we can't see the magnitude of our sin. Well, um, Dorothy and I plan to drive all the way to uh, Wyoming, and uh, we're going to, that's a thousand miles from here. Uh, at the end of the month, one of our sons is getting married, uh, our fifth son, we call him. Uh, he grew up with our sons, and there was kind of no difference between them. So he's getting married in uh, the Dude Ranch. And we plan to go to Wyoming. We're going to pray that you pray that we get there safely without accidents, without, without tickets. <laughs> the thing is, when we get on the road and the road's clear, you know, we put the metal to the metal. The pedal to the metal. And uh, we don't realize how fast we're going until up comes the little lights. And then we realize, my word, I was breaking the law. Oh, we wouldn't realize that until those lights come on. Sin is a fatal disease. It's a 100% thing. If you sin, God said to Adam, in the day you sin, you will die. It's 100%. None of us gets out of this world alive. You know, we all die and go to meet our Maker. For those of us who receive Jesus Christ by faith, uh, fortunately, for those of us who receive him by faith, we will go to be with Jesus Christ for all of eternity. So how do we rid our hearts of sin? First of all, we recognize sin for its destructive and diabolical nature. Then we view sin as God views sin. We view sin as God views sin. Listen to Isaiah in uh, 116, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, 
Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. So I think God thinks we can live a good, righteous, holy life. If we can just wash ourselves clean, make ourselves clean, remove the evil of our deeds from God's sight, and cease to do evil. God does not grade on a curve. Now, we got some teachers around, you know, if, uh, two, if you give a test and two kids pass, do well, and the rest not, the rest have failed, you know, you sort of level the playing field a bit, and you know, it, it, it makes the teacher look bad if he goes to the principal and says, well, only two passed and all the rest failed. So you want to look good as a teacher, so you grade all the students on a curve. Sin doesn't have that. Either you're sinning or you're not sinning. There's no little sin and big sin. You know, we can stay here and say, oh, that cruel man, he, he uh, kidnapped three women for 20 years. Oh, how bad he is. And, uh, you know, we can point a finger at him and forget that there are three pointing back at us. No, we know what his sin is. Uh, we haven't exposed our sins to everyone else. But it's not the size of sin, it's the majesty of God that matters. You know, some people tell the white lies. Some people tell the black lies, you know. And we have this gradation. But I know we're sinning or we not. It's not the size of the sin or the magnitude of the sin, it's the majesty. God that matters. So to rid our hearts of sin, we must recognize sin for its destructive and bad, diabolical nature. We must view sin as God views sin. And then we must release sin through the power of confession. We must release sin through the power of confession. To remove sin in our hearts, we must wash it out. And this comes through confession. I was blessed recently, and I went to a conference just uh, in July, this, this, you know, just a short while ago, a couple weeks ago. And uh, there were 85 pastors there. We spent a week from Wednesday through Wednesday. We went to church there on the Sunday. We did lots of good things, prayer, we had professors teaching us. It was just a wonderful time, and we had time for study and fellowship and prayer. We had four professors giving us, lecturing to us, and trying to make us good pastors. One of my very good friends, she told me, well, you know, uh, I was was. Well, he said, I'm an alcoholic. I went through AA. You know, and one of the first things about AA is you have got to confess, I am a drunk, or I am an alcoholic. If you want to be saved, don't wait till you hit rock bottom, but some people do, and at that stage they say, you know, I give up, I can't help myself. I'm an alcoholic, I will turn for help. I have people who tell me, oh, I can give whatever it is up any time I want to give it up. And you know, I say, well, why not give it up now? Well, whenever I'm ready to give it up, I can give it up. And they would never admit that they're hooked on whatever it is. We must agree, we must confess with the Father, just as the prodigal son did, Father, I have sinned against thee and against God, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your child. We must confess to God. And it says, the, the Bible tells us that uh, if we confess our sins, Jesus Christ is faithful and just, and he will forgive us of our so my friends, to rid our hearts of sin, we must recognize sin for its destructive, diabolical nature. We must view sin as God views sin. And we must release sin through the power of confession.
question is not begging God to forgive us or turn a blind eye, wink at us while we do something that's wrong. Confession is owning up. You go to AA and say, I'm a drunk. You go to al you go to some place, you go to the pastor, you go to your friend, you go to your spouse and you say, I'm a whatever it is. Whatever you're prone to do that's sinful. Confession is owning up, it's fessing up to our sinful nature. And then we don't blame care groups, you know. I was born on the wrong side of the tracks, you know. I'm running with a group of guys and uh, gals at school. and boy, They made me do it. You know, uh, flip the devil made me do it. So we must confess. We, we must give up all those other scapegoats. We just are sorry for what we did, and so we come to God and we confess, Dear God, dear Jesus Christ, I am a sinner. So to rid our of hearts of sin, we must remove sin from our hearts. Let's look at verse 18. Verse 18, we must remove sin from our hearts. And this is one of the beautiful passages of the Bible. I'm so glad I'm preaching on this. God says, come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. That is such a poetic, beautiful, moving passage. God wants us to remove sin from our hearts. We cannot do this in our own strength. We, may, we need to come to someone else. And I'm going to advocate today that we come to Jesus Christ. He is to someone else. To remove sin from our hearts. We must put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. For you know, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. As the Bible says, Jesus Christ is faithful and just, and He will forgive us of us if we're truly sorry. And we come to Him by faith. He can remove our sins as far as the east is from the west, drop them in the sea of forgetfulness. My friends, the penalty of sin is death. Someone has to die for our sins. That's God's law. If you sin, somebody's going to die. Something has got to die. Someone has got to die. Now, the question is, are you going to die for your own sins? Are you going to die in your pride? Die in your own sins? Or are you going to allow Jesus Christ to die for you as a substitute? He came from heaven and he died as a substitute for us. He shed his blood and gave his life that we might have my friends, we are given a choice, sin and die, or sin, and after Jesus Christ, to forgive us of our sins, because he died for our sins. God wants us to get our hearts right. So to rid our hearts of sin, we must recognize sin for its destructive and diabolical nature. We must view sin as God views sin. We must release sin through the power of confession, and we must remove sin from our hearts. May God bless each and every one of us. May God use us in God's kingdom. May we all come to Jesus Christ by faith and receive Him in our hearts. May we become children of God, and may we rid our hearts of sin. May we get our hearts right. Let us now turn to hymn 881. Hymn 881. And confess. Hymn 881 as we stand, those who are able. The affirmation of faith, hymn 881. Apostles' Creed, I 
believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of
Lord, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now and forever and all of God's children say, Amen. Amen.